Gresham College presents Long Finance Spring Conference 2012, Part 1 Pro Cyclicality of Financial Regulation and How to Deal with It by Professor Charles Goodhart. We've been a supporter of Long Finance for a number of years, and I'm particularly looking forward to this afternoon's programme and hoping it will help answer or at least clarify some of the important questions of the day. As financial markets continue their process of expanding and contracting, the pendulum is swinging back from the excesses precipitated by the credit bubbles towards austerity. Should we be trying to arrest the swing of the pendulum? Can we limit its amplitude, or if not, at least its frequency? And if so, how? This year, global sustainability is in the spotlight as never before from the global Occupy movement to regulatory reform, from the European debt crisis to ticking pension time bombs. The definition and delivery of sustainability and long finance are finally getting the time and attention that they deserve. Rio Plus 20 later this year will represent a real focal point on a lot of these debates and will hopefully catalyze these issues in deliverable and actionable plans. Today's discussion, in its own way, will contribute to that greater debate. I'd like to conclude by thanking Long Finance and the Gresham College for the great work that they do in convening these events that aim to improve society's use and understanding of finance over the long term. In particular, I'd like to thank Michael Minelli for all of his work in making this possible. And also, before I forget, Good luck to all the award hopefuls who will be attending the Sustainable City Awards at Mansion House this evening. So now if you'd please join me in welcoming today's host, Michael Minnelli, to the stage. Thanks very much. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real delight to look out on a sea of faces here as uh, Long Finance uh, has one of its uh, two big annual conferences. And I'm very pleased to welcome you here, and my sincere thanks uh, not to our usual sponsors, uh, not just to our usual sponsors, Gresham College and the City of London Corporation, but also to Kagan and the entire team at Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, for helping out uh, so wonderfully and providing us with uh, such, fantastic, uh, so, such a fantastic venue and refreshments. Now, Long Finance, as you know, uh, is, is here really to answer the big question, when would we know our financial system is working? Uh, we're not that arrogant to think we're going to come out of this afternoon with a, a fully transcribed uh, edition of the answer uh, for examination purposes. But we do hope to end today with uh, some thoughts and considerations and discussion that leaves you thinking uh, a little bit more hard about where we'd like to go. There are a number of things that talk about uh, history. You know, those who uh, fail to learn from history are condemned to repeat it. Or Mark Twain, history never repeats itself exactly, but it sometimes rhymes. Uh, but today, I think we're going to be looking at history because procyclicality and value are two things that we'd like to explore today. We'd like to look back over the course of history and see what we can learn. In terms of things that uh, I'd like to achieve today, well, sadly, we're not going to have as much fun as we did a couple of years ago when we had 350 people singing in the cellars of the Willis Center on financial reform. Uh, but I do think we've got some amazing uh, speakers today who are going to explore uh, the folly of value. When we first looked at this back between 2005 and 2008 before publishing The Road to Long Finance, we found that what we were looking at was very clearly a systemic crisis, one where, yes, many parts of the system failed, but in no way, shape, or form did we feel that this was due to one individual group. So the financial crisis is not about bankers or about rating agencies or about us as people who take out mortgages. It's about all of us, and it's about the system and the things that we would like to see changed. We also, as you know, see it as evolution and not revolution. It's, it's due to consideration and not posturing. And so I'm delighted to see so many of you here today ready to put your thinking caps on and try and learn. So I'd just like to uh, touch on the, the agenda for the day before we move forward. Um, we're going to have a, a keynote speech on the pro-cyclicality of financial regulation. 
uh, by Professor Charles Goodhart, uh, associated with many organizations, uh, but certainly the London School of Economics. And then we will have a panel on the pros and cons of stable monetary value. The reason for this really is that whilst there are many issues, such as is, is too big to fail, too big to regulate, um, does process drive out diversity, uh, what, what do we mean by uh, regulatory uh, situations driving out diversity, etc., we keep coming back to the nature of money. And Charles uh, wrote the foreword to an interesting book uh, on where does money come from, uh, which we will be touching on, I'm certain, during that panel. We'll then have a break because long finance is about meeting other people who have ideas different from your own. And then we'll move into a short presentation by Dr. Matthew Kernan, who has come over uh, from Canada to chat to us about how to incentivize sustainable finance. Uh, and then we'll have a close and another opportunity to uh, have a, a, bit of a, a bit of a drink and meet others of like and dissimilar minds. So that's the situation. Um, I'd just like to take a brief moment. You have in your packs uh, biographies for all of the speakers, uh, but I think in the case of Charles, I'd just like to read a, a short section out of a book uh, about Charles and uh, why many of us uh, admire him. Professor Charles Goodhart was chief advisor to the Bank of England when he formulated an observation on regulation, Goodhart's Law. The original formulation being, as soon as the government attempts to regulate any particular set of financial assets, these become unreliable as indicators of economic trends. Goodhart's initial observations emerged from monetary policy and regulation, and the law has subsequently be re been reformulated as any observed statistical regularity will tend to collapse once pressure is placed upon it for control purposes, or even more broadly rephrased as, when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. Now, I'm sure that uh, Charles probably winces sometimes when people say, ah, Charles Goodhart of Goodhart's Law, and he's gone to do many, many other more important and interesting things, I'm sure, but it's still nice to have, I think, a law of finance named after you. And Charles is going to share all of his recent thinking with us now. Professor Charles Goodhart. Uh, Michael, thank you very much. Um, actually, of the three formulations of Goodhart's Law that you read out, it was the second one that was actually the one that, were, that uh, I gave in a, in a speech to the Reserve Bank of Australia in 1965. Um, it was actually a footnote. It was a slightly bad jest. Because what had happened was that at that time, central banks around the world uh, were engaging in what was then described as pragmatic monetarism. And they were each trying to control a monetary aggregate. And virtually all the central, or many of the central banks, tried to control different monetary aggregates. But whichever monetary aggregate a central bank was trying to control, it was the one that actually ceased to behave in the way that it had previously behaved in their own country. And this was a, a sort of rueful look at that particular uh, phenomenon. Uh, as I say, it was, a, it was a, uh, a footnote, a jest, and it's better to be known by, by as it was that form by a jest than not at all. Um, though exactly the same thought, more or less, uh, got properly formulated by Bob Lucas into what is known as the Lucas Critique, which went on to, to, to show that any econometric model uh, which was not based on uh, fundamental behavioral uh, optimal uh, mechanisms uh, would break down once the control system changed because all the agents involved in the model would change their behavior. Uh, and the Lucas critique uh, was one of the factors that got Bob Lucas his Nobel Prize. But I do have to say that I like to think that my, uh, my law has actually got one factor which is slightly better than Lucas' critique, because the Lucas critique only relates to the behavior of the agents upon whom the control mechanism is imposed. 
Whereas one of the features that I've always noted is that when a measure becomes a target, it's not only those upon whom the target is applied whose behavior changes, it's the authorities as well, because they are very concerned to ensure that their particular measure works well, because frequently they are given some political commitment that we will achieve such and such in the field of health or education or whatever. And the measuring rod that we impose upon the system will be such and such. And therefore, in order to meet their commitment, they will change their behavior in such a way as to make meeting that commitment uh, somewhat easier than before. However, let me not spend time on that, uh, but to go on and uh, deal with the subject matter at hand, which is why financial regulation, with the best will in the world, and always trying to do the right thing, frequently acts in such a way as to exaggerate and enhance the amplitude of the cycle. In other words, it's pro-cyclical. And the reason why this is so is because regulation is inherently reactive. You get a crisis, something terrible get, happens, uh, the economy and society is damaged, and the immediate and inevitable response is to say, that must never happen again. And so what you do is, after a crisis, you tighten. But you tighten, of course, at just the point when everything is weakest and where the tightening, therefore, drives the economy further down. Um, and I'll give you one or two examples of that uh, with the present crisis. But again, if we go back into history, and Michael mentioned that there will be history on this occasion, um, the South Sea bubble was one of the first and largest financial crises that we ever had. Uh, and the South Sea Company was a joint stock incorporated <coughs> company in which everybody bought shares and the share price racketed up. And then you had the bust and the share price went down. So the immediate answer of the regulators after the South Sea bubble uh, experience was to forbid uh, all similar joint stock limited liability companies for a very long time. And now, of course, we rely uh, on that form of governance for the operation of the economy. Now, one of the problems is that regulations are there to prevent people in the economy, the agents on whom the regulation is imposed, from doing what they want to do. And hence, it tends inevitably to limit certain forms of innovation and to spur other forms of innovation simply for the purpose of getting round the regulation. And as a generality, it tends to have a restrictive effect on growth. So immediately after the crisis, you impose really tough regulations to try and prevent anything bad, similar, going, happening again. But then as time passes and no further crisis actually ensues, the drawbacks of those regulations, their disadvantages, uh, become more apparent and more and more people find way around the regulations and the restrictions. And therefore the restrictions tend to be seen as both failing to achieve anything, and also, or alternatively, uh, to have considerable disadvantages. And there is also a tendency uh, for there to be, when times are good, something of a race to the bottom. Uh, the UK consciously introduces a light touch because we want London to grow compared to uh, other financial centres as an international financial centre. Uh, except in the immediate aftermath of a crisis, financial institutions, or at any rate large ones, can always bully governments by threatening to move to another country where the regulation is easier. So, inevitably, regulation erodes over time, and as the economy strengthens, and as we have the upward phase of the longer-term uh, credit cycle, 
uh, the regulation tends to get weaker and weaker. And most of the regulations that were put in in the aftermath of the Great Depression, such as Glass-Steagall, were increasingly being taken away uh, during the course of the 70s and the 80s and so on. And the same is almost bound to happen in future because it is a sort of almost an inherent part uh, of the response of us to these kind of situations. Indeed, I am prepared now to give a forecast. It's easier for me because in 20 years' time I shan't be here. My forecast goes wrong. But I am prepared to give a forecast that the next financial crisis will occur in about 20 years' time by which time most of the regulations that have been put in place in the aftermath of the 2008 and subsequent crisis uh, will have uh, become uh, eroded either by people getting around them uh, or eroded because they seem to be unnecessary and undesirably restrictive. Now, it's not only these longer-term cycles whereby you restrict just when everything is at its weakest and most fragile and everyone is most risk-averse. So you actually don't need regulation. And after 2008, I sometimes, half in jest, said you could sack every single financial supervisor in the world and it wouldn't make the slightest bit of difference because everyone in financial institutions has become so risk-averse that they will all effectively behave much more uh, conservatively and carefully, and so you don't actually need supervisors. But at the time when you do need the supervisors, everyone will be so confident and so buoyant and think that this time it's different, to paraphrase Rogoff and Reinhardt, that the supervisors actually don't do very much because, you know, they're human like the rest of us, and they tend to go along with the conventional wisdom. But even in the shorter run, market forces tend to make regulation pro-cyclical. Uh, asset values and the profits that bank make, make and capital and the ease of market access to liquidity are all much, much easier in the boom. In 2007, and indeed almost up to Lehman's, not quite, but almost up to Lehman's, most of the central bankers around the world did not believe that the subprime crisis could develop into a state that would threaten the financial system of the world and could really be really bad. And why not? Because in 2007, it was thought that never had the banks around the world been better capitalized, never had they had uh, better capital ratios, never had they had such high profits. And they didn't believe that what then appeared to be a, a relatively minor shock could have such a major effect. So, a given capital assets ratio or a given liquidity ratio can be much more easily achieved in a boom. Much more easily achieved in a boom. And the regulations are, are easy uh, during boom conditions uh, for financial institutions and to meet because they appear to be in a very much stronger state. Now, let me describe some of the current developments, particularly in Europe, which are, in many ways, quite an extreme example. The overall capital held by the banks in 2007 appeared to be strong. But within the overall capital, the Tier 1 and the Tier 2, which were significantly greater than the 8% required minimum, the actual quality of the capital had been going down, which is something I will talk about fairly shortly. And the core equity base uh, had actually been reduced in many cases to below 2%. So a leverage ratio of total assets to equity of over 50 to 1, which means that it doesn't take very much in the way of a reduction of the market value 
of the assets of the banks involved, effectively to wipe out the equity base. And it was really only the equity that could absorb the loss. Now, the equity requirements as a result of that experience uh, have been raised by the regulators from around this level which they were in 2007, 2008 to about 2%. 2% 2 of risk-weighted assets, that's what RWA stands for, to 9% in 2012. Now this is at a time when the market equity value of the banks has gone rocketing down, when market values are well below book values, and when the attempt by any bank to raise new equity uh, in the market, uh, as I think it was Unicredito tried in Italy, uh, have the result of reducing the market value of that bank uh, still further and dramatically to the fury of the existing shareholders. So it is extremely difficult for banks, to, or unattractive to banks, to raise new equity at the time, at this moment. With the result, of course, that when you have to get your ratios up to some level, that what you do is you actually cut down on your total assets. There's a process of deleveraging, a massive deleveraging process going on particularly in Europe uh, at the moment, which has been to some, but only to some limited extent, uh, mitigated and re reduced in strength by the long-term refinancing operations, or LTRO, which Mario Draghi uh, of the ECB has just introduced. And liquidity regulations and requirements are following along, notably the net stable funding ratio. But in Europe, at any rate until the LTRO exercise came into operation, um, most of the major banks were incapable of raising the kind of long-term funding that the NSFRs actually required. Thank God the liquidity ratios are not going to be introduced except with a very long lag. But whether the economy will have recovered and the banks, will, and the banks funding opportunities will have recovered sufficiently to allow them to meet the NSFR requirement or liquidity requirements in time has yet to be seen. Now, does all of this matter? Well, if you're a monetarist, like my friend Tim Congdon, um, it certainly does. And indeed, even in a paper, a working paper brought out by a couple of economists from the Bank of England, uh, effectively it was shown that uh, the requirement to force banks to raise a great deal more capital uh, reduces the money stock. And one of the fascinating developments in recent years has been the quantitative easing, which initially had been thought by many to work by increasing uh, the bank's credit expansion and money supply, has had no effect whatsoever in that, in that, in that, through that channel. It has had effects um, through uh, a variety of other routes, but not through that channel. But if one focuses on bank credit, um, uh, the shift from deposits to capital should have much less effect, and perhaps even a positive effect, because it reduces, uh, by raising capital, reduces the number of zombie loans, the forbearance that banks maintain, enabling them to increase loans for new, better enterprises, possibly SMEs. Nevertheless, this process of tightening, of tightening regulatory requirements dramatically in the immediate aftermath uh, of the bust, and while the banking system is still extremely fragile, uh, is hardly to be recommended uh, as the best way of doing things. Now, how do we deal with this kind of pro-cyclicality? I think the first thing we've got to do is to recognize the syndrome and that this is likely to, to, to happen. And there has been an attempt by the Basel Committee and Banking Supervision to apply capital adequacy requirements, or CARs, in a counter-cyclical manner. 
In other words, to have a 2.5% add-on during the period of financial boom. Now, I doubt whether that will work uh, for a variety of reasons. First is that 2.5% is just too small. Think of the difference in financial conditions between 2006 and 2012. I mean, 2.5% on the capital ratio is really tiny compared to the enormous swing round that occurred between the top of the boom and where we are now. Then, the problem is that if you're going to have these kind of counter-cyclical measures, as is intended in the UK uh, with the uh, FPS or the um, FPC or the Financial Stability um, Policy Committee, um, if you're going to impose uh, additional countercyclical requirements during the boom time, you've got to do it by saying that this is an unsustainable boom. And it's very difficult and indeed unpopular ever to say that a boom is unsustainable because a boom is enjoyed by everyone. And if people didn't think that the boom would be sustainable, it wouldn't go on. So you are actually taking steps against the general viewpoint of the market. And while the steps may be right, even if you are right and take steps to, in a sense, moderate the boom, and the boom doesn't result in disaster, then people will say you needn't have done that in the first place. So in order to give a FPC sufficient backbone to undertake countercyclical measures, you really do need to have a number of presumptive indicators of series that actually tell you on the basis of historical experience when the situation may be getting into trouble and when you should be taking action. And the problem here is that there's a great deal of disagreement on what these may, may be. And then again, we haven't used these kind of counter-cyclical macro-prudential measures, so there's going to be a huge amount of uncertainty about how they work, about the transmission mechanism. And that will make for, in my view, a great deal of caution, at least for a time, and so they're not likely to be fully effective in stopping the cyclicality of regulation. Now, what else could you do? Well, the application of ratio controls was not based on any proper economic analysis. It was done purely pragmatically in 1987-88, uh, when the Basel I, the first of the capital uh, adequacy ratios, was not put into place. Indeed, the Basel I and Basel II requirements actually worsened the condition for the use of equity as a buffer against unexpected losses. Because a buffer only works if it is a buffer beyond the minimum requirement. And the minimum requirement is something you can't break without having severe reputational concerns. Moreover, bank managers focus on return on equity because they answer to shareholders. And capital adequacy requirements, forcing banks to hold a much greater uh, required capital holding, particularly equity holding, make the achievement of a high return on equity much more difficult. So what bank managers did in response to Basel I and Basel II was that they lowered the quality of the capital that they held to meet the requirement. And they increased the leverage, the total volume of assets, relative to their risk-weighting assets. That's why they held so much of the AAA CDOs, because if it was AAA, you didn't, weren't required to hold much capital against it. And when the value of these AAAs went down, as they did, it made the situation of these banks so much worse. And they also reduced the buffer of equity above the minimum that they have to hold. They reduced it in very sharply. So the banks went into the system holding a very small buffer above the minimum that they were required to hold as a generality. So what we need, I think, is a new approach to ratio controls. And instead of one ratio, we need two. I think we need a lower ratio when the bank becomes just too dangerous to allow management to continue. And we need a much higher 
ratio, which represents what you might describe as a fully satisfactory level. Perhaps a level that is rather like holiness, i.e. one to which many of us would wish to attain, but where most of us will actually never achieve. And the two need to be connected by a ladder of sanctions, mild to begin with, but much more severe as we move towards the lower closure point. Now, sanctions could be charges, pecuniary charges for milder shortfalls, but like the Eurozone uh, penalties uh, for going over the top on fiscal policy, a pecuniary penalty makes you even more fragile as you, get, as you get worse. And so pecuniary penalties can only really be applied in a mild way to relatively mild uh, shortfalls from the desirable level, of, fully desirable level of capital. And as you go down, what you need instead is limits on outpayments from the bank to make them retain profits, limits on dividends, buybacks and bonuses. Um, and there's a precedent now in the Basel Committee in the limitation on such outpayments in the conservation range between 7 and 4.5% of equity, uh, of core tier 1 equity. So, uh, um, I, if I may just now end, um, I, equity shareholders... Uh, with limited liability, have exactly the same incentives as managers to take on additional risk because they too have limited downside because of limited liability and unlimited upside. It's exactly the same structure of, of payout as with a call option. And as with a call option, if you're a shareholder, it is actually rational to want your managers to take on more risk. And the idea that one of the responses to incentives in this kind of crisis is to align the uh, objectives and incentives of managers uh, with that of shareholders is, in my view, exactly wrong. Because it is the shareholder who is very keen, in rationally very keen, for the management to take on more risk. And it was indeed the risky banks like Northern Rock and RBS, which were the darlings uh, of the London stock market. Now, the need instead is to transfer ownership and governance from the shareholders and the existing managers as the bank becomes riskier to a set of other stakeholders, such as bondholders and maybe the government uh, who represent the taxpayers. But the problem is actually, how do you do it? And the problem is we don't have a very good way of measuring risk uh, all our ways of measuring risk are, are, are really fallible. Um, and there's a really severe difficulties in the details of how you handle go governance and ownership arrangements uh, as the bank moves from being really well capitalized uh, towards a very much more dangerous condition. But I think that we need to try and deal with these ownership, governance, and incentive issues uh, much more carefully and rely less on regulations, which, with all the best will in the world, I think are always going to be, to some large extent, uh, pro-cyclical. Thank you very much. For more information, please visit www.gresham.ac.uk.